Well, good morning, church. Good morning. How many of you are moms in the house? Just stand up so we can recognize all the moms in the house. Just stand up. Okay. That's a lot of moms. You're uh, good, to, good to see you. Uh, I want to give this quick spiel. There's another precious day in June that will, will, that will come and go, but you moms are the real heroes of the home. You really are, and uh, maybe you don't feel like it today, but it'll come back to you, and you'll see that all the seeds you've planted have grown. At least that's my prayer for you, that you'll see the seeds that you planted blossom, and you'll see fruit for your labor, all the heartache, all the prayers and sacrifices. So we salute you today, moms. Amen, guys? Amen. Well... Now I'll put this on the record of what I've just said. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 1 through, I think it's like 12, is the text today. We're going to be talking about living a life that pleases God. We're going to talk about what that, what that means for us to please God. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 1 through 12. Would you stand in reverence for the reading of God's Word? Finally, brothers, we instruct you how to live in order to please God as, in fact, you're living. Now we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control his own body in a way that's holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the heathen who do not know God, and that in this matter no one should wrong his brother or take advantage of him. The Lord will punish men for all such sins as we have already told you and warned you. For God did not call you to be impure but to live holy, a holy life. Therefore, he who rejects this instruction does not reject man, but God, who gives you His Holy Spirit. Now, about brotherly love, we do not need to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. And in fact, you do love all the brothers throughout Macedonia. Yet we urge you, brothers, to do so more and more. Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, to work with your hands just as we told you, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders and so that you will not be dependent on anybody. Well, Father, we thank you for your word, your gift to us, the church, your living word, a pattern a standard for living. Lord, teach us today through it. I pray that you'd guide us. I pray that we indeed might leave this place to be examples for you uh, in a pagan world to show the world how to live. Father, help us and, and help us to, to receive your word today and all that it has for us that we, we might truly grow and others would say that we've been with Jesus. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Now, I want you to think about the world that Paul's writing to in Thessalonica. The world is influenced by two, two major streams in, in that time. It's Greek culture and the Roman Empire. Now, there were some things that was distinguishing about the Roman Empire particularly that, that makes it stand out. It had a system of government as well as Greek that was unsurpassed in the world. It had security. But this is the fault of both those cultures, Greek as well as, as Roman. They were a promiscuous society. Sex was wide open, and it was any kind of sex, whatever you wanted to do, that was the world you wanted to live in. It sounded like Times Square 
of, of another time because it was really that kind of world. And, and because of that, Paul's writing to the believers in Thessalonica and challenging them to live a different kind of life. In fact, today I want to say to you two things about pleasing God that the passage is talking about. One is in the area of sexual morality. The second one is in relation to other people. And really they kind of dovetail together. He says to them, I don't want you to be immoral and unrestrained like the world, he says. I want you to be different. What a subject today to be preaching on on Mother's Day is sex. The young men in the room's ears have perked up and they're thrilled to death and others are squirming. This old preacher got up to preach and he preached a sermon on sex the whole time he was on that subject. This old lady leaned over and she said, I wished I knew as little about sex as that man up there does. <laughs> He's calling us to walk in a different way, to walk with a different standard. He says, in fact, I urge you to walk in this way. Do our actions please God, I think is a good place to jump off at. Do our actions please God? Finally, brothers, verse 1, we instructed you how to live in order to please God. What's the finally mean? It means everything before chapter 4 in this letter to the Thessalonians. Is our life pleasing God? Or maybe is our life pleasing other people more than it pleases God. Now that's something to think about. Are we a people pleaser or are we a God pleaser in our culture? Because remember, the issue for the Thess Thessalonians is that God is calling them through the Apostle Paul to live a life different than the life of the world. Because remember the culture. He's calling them to live counter to the culture. And I think it's just as relevant today that he calls us as a church to live counter to the culture that we live in, to live as a different people, to be the very bride of Christ and walk with him. He says to them, basically, I want you to go further in your walk. Now, we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this. How? Verse 1. More and more. You do it, but he says, I want you to grow in that grace. Go further in your walk. God doesn't want us to stay where we are. He wants us to expand and grow to encourage and, and to be what God's called us to be. 1 Thessalonians 2.12, he says, Encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God who calls you into His kingdom and glory. He calls you into His kingdom and to His glory. He calls the church to walk in His kingdom, in His rule, not according to our rules. And you know, I, I really believe that this is God's Word and His standard. I, I've had people say, well, that's what Paul taught her. This, well, let me tell you, it is the Word of God. Now, whether we walk in that way, that's something else. It's still the Word of God. Think about this for a minute. When every county has some people with the Department of Transportation that's over a sign crew. Now, some counties have more, but most counties just have a crew that takes care of that, most of the small counties. Is there anybody here that does that with the DOT? I don't want to sound like I know everything. Okay. Well, the neat thing about it, those guys put up the stop signs. They put up everything, all the signs, and they continually keep those things in working order for the most part. It's not like a third world country, right? Now, it makes no difference that I have not met the man or woman who put the stop sign up at the end of College Street, right? But if I'm deciding one day that yeah, I just don't think that's the law of the state of North Carolina, I just decide I'm going to pass that sign up because it just doesn't matter. Well, we've got a guy sitting in the center aisle about halfway back. He's been paid by the state of North Carolina who doesn't know who put that sign up either, he'll write you a ticket in a heartbeat. But he'll be kind about it, and he'll explain it while he's writing you the ticket, while you're telling him you don't have to stop at it. In fact, you tell any of North Carolina's finest that way, and I guarantee you you get you a ticket. 
So it doesn't matter who put the sign up. It's a matter that it's the way of the law. Well, this is God's Word. Paul was one of the signposts. Doesn't matter that I don't know Paul. So did Moses. He said some laws that was handed down by God, but I don't know Moses, but it's still the law. Are you with me? They've erected the signpost. And then the signpost goes further and says, okay, in this area of sexual immorality, I want you to be holy. I want you to be sanctified is the fancy word he uses. That means to be set apart. Now think for just a moment. For the most part, this room is a set-apart building, isn't it? You won't come here and find uh, WWF wrestling here, would you? For one reason, we wouldn't let them come because they like to cuss and raise sand. So we wouldn't let them come here, right? It's a sanctuary. It really is a place that's set apart for the people of God in this community to reach out to this community. Now, part of how this building reaches out is through worship, doesn't it? Now, there's some other functions that goes on, but it's set apart for the outreach for this community, for the glorification of Almighty God, isn't it? You wouldn't find this cross sitting down at, uh, I'm going to have to find me a, name, a silver bullet. I don't even know if there's a silver bullet around. It used to be one down in Spartanburg, but anyway, that's a different story. You wouldn't find that there because it's set apart. It's, it's holy. It's, it's, it's holy. It's holy. Uh, we're not going to celebrate communion on, on the bar stool. This is the communion table. This is the altar of God. This is where we, we meet Him here. This, so this is a precious place, isn't it? It's a precious place. You're set apart as well to live holy lives in the, in the face of God and in the face of the world. Leviticus 11, 44 and 45. You remember last week when I mentioned to you about the theme of, of, of Leviticus? Who can say it for me right quick? Holiness. God's holy word to be holy. That's what the passage is saying. He says to us in Leviticus 11, 44 and 45, As he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct because it's written, Be holy as I am holy. We're set apart for the work of God. 2 Timothy 2, 20 and 21, Paul writes to Timothy, In a large house, in a large house there are, there are articles not only of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Some are for noble purposes, some for ignoble. If a man cleanses himself from the latter, he will be an instrument for noble purposes, made holy, useful to the master, and prepared to do any good work. I would say to you, you're a set-apart person. God's called you for His work, a noble work. We're instruments designed to bring honor to God. God called the Thessalonians out of, of their culture to live sexually pure lives. And He calls us to do that as well, to live different than the culture, to live different than the world, to live in the ways of the Lord, to be a conduit of God's love, God's grace. God's called us to live a radical life in the midst of our culture. We really can't pull ourselves from the culture because we're in the midst of it. But we're, as Paul said, in the world, but we don't need to be of the world. We're called to live holy, clean, and be holy, clean vessels for Jesus. He says, avoid, abstain from sexual immorality. Avoid it. Avoid it if you can. Would any of us, if you knew, if you knew, uh, you're, going, you're, 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 you're headed to Charlotte today, which would mean you've had a stroke. But if, if you were headed to Charlotte and you knew that, that there's been uh, some shootings every day this week at 12 o'clock down on, uh, what is that? Well, 49 as you're coming down downtown. What is that street? Tron. You're, you're downtown Tron. And you've heard there have been shootings down every day at 12 o'clock. I just ask you. Would you go down there today at around 12 o'clock, would you? No. You'd avoid it. And Paul's saying this is a pitfall for you in your life, so you need to avoid it. Watch out for these things because, remember, 
you're a vessel for God. And God wants to use you to glorify Him. Verse 5, do not act like... Verse 5, man, underline it. Do not act like those who do not know the Lord. Do not act like those who don't know God. For Verse 7, for God did not call us to be impure, but to live what? A holy life. Don't use other people, he says. That's really what immorality is. It's really using somebody for your gain, for your pleasure, for that period of time. So he says, don't do that. Live in a different way. So we want a life that lives, pleases God. So what? Then that means we walk in a different way in our life. And then he turns to this whole idea of community and to one another. He says, you need to love one another. And he says, you're doing that. Look at the passage. He says to him about the sexual immorality, you're doing that, you're walking with God, you're doing it, but do it more and more in walking with God. And he turns around and he says, as far as community, yeah, you are loving more, you are doing that, you are showing love, but do it more, do it more. Don't be content where you are in your Christian life. Go further, go further. Excel in the Christian life. Press on toward the mark of the high calling of Christ Jesus. As I look at this crowd, you're a pretty handsome and pretty crowd, you know? But do I, I don't see anybody here that looks like they've got it all together with Jesus yet. It looks like we're all pressing on. Now, we've got some that if I'm telling you, if it rains, they're drowned. That's just all it is to it because they're better than anybody else. I can't help it. They're everywhere, okay? They are. They're even here. But God bless them. They'll be all right if it don't rain. But the rest of us, they, they've got there. They're with Jesus, okay? They've already pressed on. Okay, I can't do anything about them. But the rest of us are, are on the way. And Paul's saying, keep on traveling in the Christian life. Don't settle for mediocrity. Travel with the Lord. Press on, press on, he says in another place. We need to press on in our Christian life in showing love to one another. Don't be content with just a little love. Continue to press on in love. How does he say that we need to do that? You can underline it in your scripture. This is good stuff. If you want some stuff, it'll make you, you tingle in the back of your neck. This is good. This is good for all us ignorant people that's slow of learning and things. This is some of this deep stuff that you're going to have to ponder about. If you want to know about a life of love, what's it look like? Well, Lead a quiet life, Paul says. Lead a quiet life. Don't have to be smart to figure that one out. Lead a quiet life. Are you building the unity in the body of Christ? Or, or is it all about you? Are you building the body of Christ? Is the kingdom of God's rule so real in your life that you're building the body of Christ because you're showing love to one another? like you're supposed to do it? Or do you run roughshod over other people? Because if you are, the love's not in you, and it's not of God. Are you walking in the way of love and leading a quiet life? Leading a quiet life. Not full with turmoil and, and, and a smoke cloud of heartache around you. Are, are you really leading a quiet life? that you love and honor other people and that you are loved and honored because of the kind of person you are. I tell you what, there's a lot of people all through the years in my churches. I've had people that, that were just like big old freight trains. Man, they just, when they come in the room, the room just trembles. You know, that's the kind of people they were. They get stuff done, man, just, you know what I mean? You know what I'm talking about. I've had a people that had all kind of other gifts, but the people who's made a difference in my life, and that's all I can talk about. I can't talk about somebody else, but the people that's made a difference in my life were those who led a quiet life in Jesus Christ and was a blessing, was a blessing. I mean, they were like, they were like a drink of cold water on an old hot day when you worked hard and you, you're parched and, and you, you need some good cold water. They were like a mountain stream of living water. I think that's what it means to live a quiet life. A quiet life is somebody, as you go further in the text, that does this. You mind your own business, Paul said. Now, does anybody need a commentary to understand what it means to mind your own business? 
I cannot manage my own business enough, let alone manage Dan Flynn's business. I, I mean, I can criticize Dan. I can write his back. I can meddle in his business. I've got too much business of my own to meddle in. And Dan does not need me riding his back. He needs me to stay out of his business. I can be there in the love. Amen, Dan. Praise God. But I can be a better blessing to him by not managing his business, but just being a force of love for him and encouraging him when he slips, when he falls. He doesn't need me to judge him. Neither does, does, does uh, Warren over there. He doesn't need that. We need one another to pick us up and help carry us, and that's what love does. That's that quiet life. What else does it mean? Well, it means that you're going to work. You're going to work. Responsibility in the community of faith means we're going we're to love, we're going to live a quiet life, we're going to mind our own business, and we're going to work. We're going to work. It's kind of hard when you're really working for the kingdom of God be meddling in everybody else's business, isn't it? It's kind of hard when everybody's oaring the same way, got the oars, and we're all going the same way. It's kind of hard to be causing conflict. Are we all going the same way, and are we really working? I've got a sim I've really got a simple theory, and I'd love to go to Washington, and I'd love to share it with anybody to listen. It, it's this. It's really this. I'm simple-minded. It. it Give your heart to Jesus and get a job. I think you do that, you, you're done good. I love people that stand outside places wanting to work for food and they're in the shadow of a place hiring somebody to work. We've gotten too big for our britches and we ought to be willing to work for whatever we've got to work for and then make our way to something else. Now that sounds awful easy and I know it, it's uncomplicated. I'd rather not have anything but an old tent and know Jesus and get me a job at McDonald's. That might be the best quiet life you could have because there's some folk in this house, you've arrived where you are, and you wish to Almighty God you could go somewhere else down on that totem pole, but now you're making the money, you've got the debt, and you can't come on down off the totem pole. And I guarantee you there'd be a bunch in here just say, Amen. What you always thought you wanted is not necessarily what you want. This is not going to cost you anything. The happiest times of my life was when I was in a church with about 100 people just preaching every Sunday and loving the people. I always thought I wanted a bigger church. Been there and bought that T-shirt. All it'll do is get you a pacemaker or, or heart surgery. I'm just telling the way it is. Walk with Jesus and get a job. Paul says it different, doesn't he? He says, love everybody, love everybody, mind your business, don't be this busybody, go out and get your job. Stay busy for the kingdom's work is what he's really talking about. It's more than making a burger at McDonald's. Work for the kingdom, for the sake of the kingdom. And he wraps it all up. You want to know what a godly life is. Anybody in the house, you say, I really want to know what a godly house is. A godly house. A godly life is. This is, well, if you want to know what a godly house is, if you hadn't got your mama Mother's Day present, you ain't going to know what a godly house is after a while. You want a godly house, get mama something. But you want to know what a godly life is? This is what Paul says. I want you to look at this text, and we're wrapping it up. Verse 11. Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. Make it your goal to mind your own business, to work with your hands, just as we told you. Verse 12. So that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders so that your life will win the respect of outsiders so that you'll not be dependent on anybody. A godly life 
ought to be contagious to those outside. A godly church, pardon me, ought to be, pardon me, pardon me, that was rude. Pardon me, I'm sorry, I've never done that in 20... I'm sorry, Beth. Now I went to that godly home. <laughs> and anybody is laughing, God will strike you down. <laughs> All right, we got to get on task. Hang on with me. Gosh, a, go a godly life ought to be contagious. And those outsiders should have a thirst for it and a quest for what you have. That's plain and simple. You want to have a life that pleases God? Well, flee from sexual immorality and basically love one another in such a fashion that the world wants what you have. And that is counter to the culture. And God's still looking for people to walk with Him. Still looking for it. Because it's making a difference in a, in a hot, dry, thirsty world. You be the church of Jesus Christ. Amen. I want us to bow our heads. We're going to come to the table. <clears throat> Father, thank you for this morning. Uh, we've joked and we've laughed. But you've been present with us. And Lord, you've probably been more present with us than maybe we desired. We welcome you here to this table. Lord, thank you for, for each family and every home that's represented. We thank you for the women in our midst who are mothers, the others, Lord, who are not mothers but walk in the ways of you and, and love you. We praise you. We remember the night that you gathered with your disciples. Lord, you took bread and you broke it, and you said, This is my body which is given for you. Take eat. Then you took the cup, you blessed it. You said, This is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you for the forgiveness of sin. We thank you for your gift at the cross that you came. You poured out your life as an offering. God, help us to pour our life out to this community as an offering of love for you and for them almighty father thank you for the cross for the cross that took the most negative symbol in the world of death and it proved your love and your hatred of sin because it drove you to that cross and your blood was spilled poured out that we could have life literally miracle grow lord for us a fertilized for the soul. We were once dead in our trespasses, but because of that precious blood, Lord, we now live and we're whole again. Thank you. And Father, we ask that you'd pour out your Holy Spirit upon this bread and this juice, that by our partaking it of, of it, we would become the body of Christ for a broken world. And the church said, Amen. May we pray with confidence the prayer that Jesus...